Hello there ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ollie. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Warwick, soon to be junior doctor, and welcome back to my MMI interview series. Today we're tackling a slightly strange question, is it harder to be a brain surgeon or a GP? Sometimes medical interviewers like to throw in these slightly out there questions where it's not really clear what they're trying to get at, but this is just one of those ones that you can think and reason through and it will give you some insights into what it's like to work as a doctor, what the different specialty doctors do day to day and the different responsibilities that different types of doctor might have. So just to jump into this, while I'm sure that any day of the week each of these different types of doctors would tell you that their job was harder than the other person's job. This question and questions like it revolve around the fundamental differences between what these doctors do. Because while both a brain surgeon and a general practitioner will have gone through the same basic training, the same medical school experience and have, and have had very similar roles for their first few years as junior doctors, they've actually pursued extremely different paths since leaving medical school and they've separated and become experts in their own fields, which have different roles and responsibilities. So let's just remind ourselves very quickly what each of these different doctors does. A general practitioner or a GP to most people is responsible for healthcare in the primary setting, what we call primary care, when a patient first presents with a new problem. When that patient notices that something is wrong or maybe that something isn't getting better as quickly or as readily as they would expect, they'll usually go and see their GP for some advice. A brain surgeon, on the other hand, who in the trade is referred to as a neurosurgeon, they will only usually work in larger hospitals. Their role concerns performing very specialist and niche examinations, and specifically consultations on neurological conditions, as well as surgically operating and doing other invasive procedures when necessary if this is going to solve the problem. So just to explore some of the differences in the training that you might experience becoming a GP or a neurosurgeon, or a specialist doctor of any kind. The pathway to becoming a GP is quite streamlined and straightforward. Obviously, I don't mean academically straightforward, it's incredibly demanding and stressful, but it's quite clear cut. You finish medical school, you do your foundation training, your years as a junior doctor, and then you take three years of post-foundation training, and by the end of those three years and the appropriate exams, you are a general practitioner and you can practice independently. And that will usually take about 10 years in total of medical education, from starting medical school to finishing your training as a GP. Training as a neurosurgeon, or again, a specialist surgeon or doctor of any type can take considerably longer. You'll do your medical school, your foundation training, then you'll need to apply for a training number, getting that neurosurgical training post, and that will usually take at least eight years of specialist training with multiple sets of exams before you eventually reach consultant status and you can practice as a consultant neurosurgeon. And these primary roles have some quite clear distinctions between them. A GP will see many, many more patients in one day, usually for less than 15 minutes at a time on average than a neurosurgeon will who might see 10 or less patients a day. And the GP will also likely know far less about the person who walks through the door, because it could be anything from Joe Bloggs presenting with a broken toe when he dropped something on it yesterday, to someone who is having a heart attack and isn't really sure what's going on. The neurosurgeon, on the other hand, with the exception of trauma cases where people come in really acutely unwell, usually needs to have patients referred to them by another member of the healthcare team, someone in A&E, for example. And when that referral is made, that neurosurgeon will be given specific reasons why they think a neurosurgical consult needs to take place. So what this ultimately means is that that neurosurgeon has probably a better picture of what's going on with the patient they see and has a smaller window of potential conditions that they need to know about, whereas the GP needs to be able to deal with pretty much anything that comes through the door, or at least to be able to recognize it. And when it comes to actually handling these medical problems that come through the door in the form of patients, um, things again can be very different. Both doctors, for example, could prescribe a similar range of medications and drugs to try and deal with the problem or try simple interventions to try and deal with it. At the point of doing surgical interventions, however, the neurosurgeon, because they're almost exclusively found in larger hospitals, they can bring much more expensive and specialist equipment to bear to try and problem solve. This means access to high quality on-site imaging, including CT and MRI scans, and crucially, an operating 
gaming theatre with a team to help you do whatever you need to do. And that gear is just never going to be available in the average GP practice because that's not a GP's job. But what I'm saying here is that the setting in which care is taking place and care needs to be done will drastically affect the types of things that each doctor is able to try or is likely to do. The work patterns for each of these type of doctors are also very different. GPs work primarily in the community based out of some sort of GP practice or surgery, and they usually maintain a more sociable work-life balance. Although these are still very long, very hard days in many cases from 8am till 6 or 7pm with very little in the way of break. It's a bit more complicated for surgeons because they might be working days, nights, on calls, trauma cover, often through weekends, and they have to be ready to go and operate at a moment's notice. And ultimately, if you're thinking about what type of medical career you might want, it's up to the individual to prioritise the sort of life you might want during your medical training and when you become a consultant or a fully qualified GP. That's really up to you. And lastly, one of the other comparisons you might want to think about is responsibility, the different degrees of responsibility that these doctors hold for their patients. On the one hand, because of how deeply invasive neurosurgery often is, the outcomes of neurosurgical operations can be extremely poor or even fatal if things go wrong. A simple slip of the hand during an operation can result in blindness, deafness, total paralysis. And if that patient survives any of these things, that's something that that surgeon is going to have to live with for the rest of their medical career and the rest of their life. However, when we think about the GP, that GP is responsible for many, many, many times the number of patients that the neurosurgeon is and will often see them much more often. So if that GP fails to spot something or makes a mistaken diagnosis and they cause some sort of harm to one of their patients, not only is that going to be with them in their conscience, but they're probably going to have to see that patient multiple times. And that's obviously going to serve as a more frequent reminder of your mistake and the effect that you've had on that person's well-being and on their life. And once again, when you're thinking about your own medical career, that might be the sort of thing that is important to you. So that's just my thoughts on reasoning through the roles, responsibilities, the different career pathways that these two groups of doctors might have. And it doesn't have to be a brain surgeon and a GP. It could be a GP and any other hospital doctor. It could be an emergency medicine doctor or a gynecologist. It's actually the differences in what these doctors do and what they're allowed and capable of doing. It's actually gonna be the differences in the roles and responsibilities that attract different types of doctor to different specialties and what they prioritize in their own life. And actually, if you can show that you understand this to some degree, I think it shows that you're making a more informed decision about going to medical school and what you want from your own career and ultimately from your own life. That's where we'll wrap it guys. Please be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe if you've enjoyed the video. Don't forget to go and check out ollieburton.com for my full suite of free interview videos. And you'll also find hints, tips and more articles on landing at your place at medical school. Take care and I'll see you next time. So that's where we're gonna wrap this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to go and check out ollieburton.com for all of my free interview resources and videos. If you've got more questions, be sure to let me know down in the comments below. 